guy uh, that, that we're going to talk about. And then next week, we're going to talk about a real unknown situation uh, out of the Bible that you probably have never paid a whole lot of attention to either. But in both situations, it's... Uh, it's, it's people that had their backs against the wall. Uh, they were in a place where they didn't know what to do. And what do you do when you don't know uh, what to do? And so we're going we're to look at that. So uh, today, we're going we're to look at uh, a man that most of you probably never heard of, unless you were at that men's event. And, uh, and he did something really weird, and he did something really strange. Now, his back was against the wall because he found himself staring eyeball to eyeball with a wild lion, and he was by himself. It was just him and a lion by himself on a snowy day. And uh, so I'm, I'm telling you, you, you got to know that when you're by yourself and you're in the wild and you're staring face to face with a lion, that's not a good day and all God's people say it. All right? So we're going we're gonna to look at His name is Beniah. And, uh, and you, find, you find his, his, his story uh, because what Beniah did... Uh, in that situation, he did something totally, completely unexpected. I mean, it just, it just kind of blow your mind what, what he did, uh, and he became well known for it, although you probably never heard of him until tonight. But we, we'll find his story in 2 Samuel. So everybody take your Bible, take your Bible, and take 2 Samuel chapter 23, and uh, beginning at verse 20. 2 Samuel, it's in the Old Testament, and give you a moment to find it. 2 Samuel 23, and beginning at verse 20. 20. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Cosbel. He did many heroic deeds, which include killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit, and he killed it. And once, armed only with a club, he killed a giant Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Now let's time out. Just, okay, I, I get it with the two champions of Moab. I, I get it, you know, with the Egyptian warrior, the spear and all that, mano y mano. But I want to make sure we read this right. Now, I, read it again. Look, look, it, did it say that he chased a lion into a pit and killed the lion in, in a pit, and it was a, it was a snowy day. Okay, that, that's, did I read that right? And, and you did read that right. Now, you know, I've heard of lion tamers, but I've not heard too many people being lion chasers. And yet, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that here he is, he's out in the wild, it's a snowy day. The Bible goes into that and tells us it was a snowy day. And he chases this lion. He chases the lion. I would imagine. I would imagine that kind of blew the lion's mind. I mean, you know. I mean, I just bet that's the first time that a lion's come upon a human that actually went to him to kill him to chase him, and he and the lion turned tail and ran, went, went to a pit. Benaiah didn't stop there. He jumped in the pit with the lion and he killed the lion. Uh, you know. So you know, it's it's, it's amazing. Now, you, you might you might would would say you know. Uh, I'm not sure what I would do if I came face to face with a lion. And, uh, you know, I, you, you, might, you might think, hey, yes, no problem, whatever. I, I don't think I would. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm built for comfort, not for speed. Can I get an amen? All right? So, so I'm not sh- sure. But I can tell you this. I'm pretty sure I know exactly what I would do. And believe it or not, and I know some of you are going to be really surprised by this. And those of you that are watching on the screen, you're going to be really surprised by this. But I, I was in the wild with lions at one time. No joke. I, years and years ago, I, I, I spent about a month over in Africa. Uh, and I uh, hadn't talked about that in a long time. Uh, but I have never forgotten that trip. And uh, we were in Kenya. And uh, we were out in the wild. And I was staying with a missionary friend. And uh, we were staying at a missionary compound. Uh, and uh, right on, near the Tanzania border, uh, out at the Rift Valley. And, uh, and, and I noticed that when we got to the compound, that he had a 20-foot fence in the compound. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of strange. Maybe that's to keep the monkeys out or, or whatever. I didn't really think much attention to it. 
And, you know, I kind of realized, and I thought, well, we're not in a war zone or anything. There was nothing going on over there, and, you know, but it was this 20-foot fence, and it had a little bit of barbed wire on top of it. And I didn't think much of it, and so we all got checked into the missionary compound. We had, you know, we, we, and we all got in our beds. It had been late at night. It had been a long day, and uh, it's, it's probably about midnight, maybe even 1 o'clock in the morning, and I heard a lion roar. And, uh, and, and at first, I wasn't quite sure what it was, and uh, the, I was in bunk beds, and I was on the top bed, and the, this guy was under me, and I, you know, I, his name was Norman, and I said, Norman, did you hear what I he- heard? He said, yeah, man. He, I said, what is that? He said, well, I, a, I think it's a lion. And so, um, we turned on the lights. Can I get an amen? All right? And, uh, and then, we went to see our missionary friend, and we said, hey, wh- wh- what's... Was that a lion? That he's oh yeah 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 man don't worry about it man he said that that lion's probably five miles away I said you're kidding he sounds like he's right outside he said no 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 he's he's a long way away and then couldn't find out that a lion's roar can be heard over five miles away in the bush and that was just, you know so here I am so I go back to and I can't sleep I mean I'm I listen this is not a lion in a zoo this is not Disney World this is not a petting zoo this is not the North this is a lion in the wild, and I went to bed, and I couldn't sleep the rest of the night just by hearing a lion's roar. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, a lion's roar can't hurt you. Yeah, but when you know that he's not in the zoo and he's nearby, he can make you hurt yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, you know. So I know what I would do if I, if I got out of that compound and got away from that fist. I know exactly what I would do if I came face to face with a lion, and it wouldn't be to chase him down in a pit on a snowy day and kill him. And this is it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing, you know, it, it, that that he, that he did that. Now, so you know, but but I'd like to think that I that I had that kind of courage. I mean, you think about the heart of that guy, but now you think about the courage that he had, and I would like to think that I had that. And I think all of us would like to think, you know, when, I, when my back is against a wall, when I'm faced with a real problem, when there's a lion in my life or whatever, I like to think that I had that courage to chase that rascal down and, and get rid of it. But, but, and there's something, you know, within me that, that, that says, you know, I think Jesus wants me to have that because, you know, my back is against the wall often and so is yours. But, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, and, and you know, and I, I like, and I want that, and I, I think God wants me to have that kind of courage, because how many of you say amen, that fear is the enemy of faith? And fear is the enemy of faith, and, it's, and it always has been. And, uh, and the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. And, uh, and, and I know Jesus loves me, and I know he loves you, and you know, and I, you know, I want to be a man of faith, and I think you want to be a people of faith, and, you know, so I'd like to have that, and I, and I you know, and I'm, I pray for that. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to hope that, you know, if I'm faced with that kind of fear, that kind of situation, my back is against the wall, that, that I would do something totally unexpected, that, you know, something that the world would never thought that you would do, and that's, you know, just chase it down, or just, you know, keep on keeping on for Jesus, and you know, charge ahead in the name of Jesus, and, you know, that's not what's expected of the world. Uh, but, but, but we're going to take a look at that. There's, there's, and there's several thoughts about this tonight that I want us to see, uh, about what do you do when you don't know what to do? You know, what, what do you do when your back is against the wall? So there's several things we need to realize, all right? So I, you might want to write this down if you're a note taker, and if you're not a note taker, you probably want to take notes on this. Because if you haven't been there, you just hang in there, old buddy. You're going to be there. And all God's people said, all right? So, so here's several things that we need to realize. When your back is against the wall and you don't know what to do, what do you do when you don't know what to do? All right, and we're going to look at the example of Benaiah. Number one, you've got to realize, and, and I hope you realize, and I hope we all realize, that being in a tight spot may just be exactly where God wants you to be. Being in a tight spot may be exactly where God wants you to be. You know, when you come face to face with a lion in the wild, you know, the odds on favor are not going to be you. The odds on favor is going to be the lions. Lions run up to 35 miles an hour. 
and they can leap 30 feet in a single bound. And here's a, here's a man by himself. We don't know he was armed or not armed, but be honest with you, what, you know, what's the spear going to do? I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, I mean he's, out, he's out manned. I mean, he's by himself. And he's come up on this lion suddenly. Lion can run 30 feet, so he's not going to outrun him. I mean, you know, he's, he, he, that, you know that's, that's just not going to happen. And, uh, and, and lions can leap 30 feet in a single bound. So, I mean, you know, this is, you, you got to admit, man, your back is against the wall. And uh, he's, he's going to be in for, for a bad day. And not only that, but the Bible lets us know that it's snowing, that it's cold, that it's a snowy day. Now, I don't know about you, but last time I, I think lions have built in snowshoes. I think they had built-in claws, and you know, and Benaiah was at best had sandals on, and is slippery, and, and all of, all of these things. So, so here's my point: is this in, in the Christian life, when our backs are against the wall, we try to do everything we can do to avoid those bad situations. We try to do everything that we try to do that we know to do to avoid bad days, and we do it so much so that when we do have those times and our backs are against the wall that we think God doesn't care about us. That we, we have the audacity to think that God's left us or God, you know, doesn't care about us anymore because that's, you know, that's what we've been taught. We've been taught, you know, hey, you just fall in love with Jesus, man. Everything's going to fall into place. Fall in love with Jesus, man. You're going to, you know, you're going to drive, you know, you're going to be healthy. You're never going to be sick. You're always going to drive a brand new car, you know, if you're right with God, you know, and, you know, you've heard me say before, I look in the parking lot out there and a whole lot of our people ain't right with God. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, you know, so, so, so the bottom line is, you know, we're taught that and we're taught that and we kind of buy in that so much that when we, we are in those situations, when we don't know what to do and our back is against the wall, we think God has abandoned us. And so, but maybe it is that God is telling us to go against your instinct. Maybe God's calling us to, uh, you know, that those man-eating lion problems that we have are not problems at all. Maybe they're opportunities for Jesus to work in our life and all God's people said. Maybe so. All right? And how we react to those situations really will determine a lot of destiny of our lives. Now, by the way, you don't believe that? Listen, if you read on further, we don't have time to do it right now, but if you read on further, you will find that Benaiah ends up becoming the captain of David's guard. You, 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 he, he ends up being around King David, the greatest king of all of Israel, and he becomes the captain of his guard. So he ends up living in the palace with David. And, and it's a job that he didn't even apply for. I mean, he wasn't applying for the job. But you got to admit that if he was applying for the job, putting down, yeah, chased the lion into a pit, killed him on a snowy day, looks pretty good on your resume. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, you know. But, but even at that, he wasn't applying for the job, but because he, you know, because he, he reacted in a, in a way that is trusting God and trusting Jesus in a way that, you know, just wasn't normal, you know, God raised him up and God blessed him. So it could be those men. And by the way, we wouldn't know anything about Benaiah had this not happened. I mean, you know, so it could be those man-eating lion problems that you and I face and that this country is facing. You know, it just could be that they're not problems at all, but they're, but they're opportunities. So, so you've you got, you got, you got to realize that being in that tight spot may be exactly where God wants you to be. Now, how many believe that? Come on, say amen. Amen? All right. Now, number two, let's, let's go on. The second thing you've got to realize is that you realize that if there's no risk, there's no reward. Where there's no risk, there's no reward. Let me, let me tell you what I'm, uh, the journey that God is having me on. And, uh, and, and I think some of you know this, and you know, I want you to be aware of this. But I tell you, the journey that God is having me on right now is that I'm, I am learning that uh, to exercise faith is risky. Does anybody, can anybody identify with that? All right. To exercise faith is risky. I mean, it's risky business. And it's not easy. And it's, it's, it's kind of scary. That's, that's why they call it faith. That's why, you know, that's why the answers aren't always there. You, you don't know exactly what you're, you're supposed to do, you know. 
Uh, and, and by the way, I, I could tell when, when I made that statement a little while ago that not only does God not mind your back being against the wall, that he prefers it. You know, some of you were looking at me like deer caught in the headlight, you know? But, but I find in my Bible that, that risk-taking is honored by God, not, not discouraged by God. You know, risk-taking is always at the heart of God. I, I never find where God rebuked anybody for taking a risk in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say that? I never find that. Matter of fact, I find the opposite. I find those that didn't mind going against the cultural norms to get to Jesus or, 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 to, or to, to get to the heart of Jesus or to be obedient to Jesus, that God ever, ever rebuked them from doing that. And, but, but what we want to do is we want to play it so safe. You heard me say so many times, we, we, we're so afraid of getting out on a limb, we don't ever bother to climb the tree. And, and what I'm doing, what I want to do in my older age, and, you know, the back part of my ministry, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not only do I want to climb the tree, I want to get out on the limb because I know that's where the fruit is. And somebody say amen to that, amen? So, so you know, I never find where God discourages risk-taking in the name of Jesus. I, you know, you, you think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus could care less about the cultural norm of him climbing a tree and trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. I mean, this guy was rich. I mean, he was hated, but he was rich. And he knew he was short of stature, you know. But he, it just, he didn't care. It didn't bother him that anybody was looking at him. It didn't bother him what anybody was thinking of him. Man, he just wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus blessed that. And Jesus told him, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. Look, look, at, look at Peter. I mean, Peter was out in that storm. He was scared to death. He didn't care what anybody. He said, listen, Jesus, if that's you, i got to get to you. And Jesus said, well, come on. You know, and everybody, listen, Peter's not the only one that could have had that testimony. They all could have had that testimony. I have a feeling if Jesus could walk on the water and get one person to walk on the water, he could get all of them to walk on the water if they wanted to. And I know what people say. They say, well, yeah, yeah, but Peter began to sink. Well, bless God, at least for a moment, he got to walk on water. Have you ever done that? I mean, have you ever stepped out on a boat? And I haven't done that. And, you know, I don't care if he began to sink. I mean, he had a testimony. You know what? He's the only, he's the only other guy that's going to be in heaven to say, you know, I'll tell you what that felt like for about 30 seconds, man. It was awesome. Then I got scared. But the bottom line is, he didn't care. He, he didn't care what the others were thinking. He didn't care that they didn't want to get out of the boat. Peter said, man, I'm, just, I'm going to get to Jesus. And God honored his risk taking. I think about the woman that was sick for 12 years. With a heart disease or with a blood with blood problem, I mean, for twelve years she didn't she didn't care, you know, about what anybody thought. She got on her hands and knees and crawled on her belly, so that she would just have an opportunity to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. You, you never you never see Jesus saying, "Why are you doing it? Get up, woman! Come on, you're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing yourself." He didn't do that. Man, he rewarded the risk taker. I, I think about the, the four guys who uh, had, a, had, a, a, had a paralytic friend and they heard that Jesus was in town and so they, they, they went to take him. Maybe Jesus would heal and they couldn't get in the door. I mean, the crowd. I mean, the crowd was, you know, crowding them out. You know, and they couldn't get in. And, and be, be most of us would say, oh, well, too late. We should, not our bad. We should have thought sooner. Could have got them here sooner. No, 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 they didn't give up, man. They, they climbed up on the roof. I don't know how they did that. I don't know how that went down. But it took four of them to do it. They knew they couldn't do it by themselves. And then they ripped off the roof. And you didn't hear Jesus say, whoa, 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 man. Why are you destroying property here? I mean, you know, come on, settle down. I mean, you got, no, no, no. Je they, listen, they, Jesus was honored by their risk taking. And, and not only did he heal the paralytic, but he forgave him of his sin. He got more than what he even bargained for. So I never find where Jesus discourages risk-taking. Years ago, back in, back in the 1700s, there was a poet and an author and a writer named Johann, Johann Wolfgang von Gogh. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it don't matter if I don't. You would know if I was or not. But anyway... Uh, he wrote, uh, as a matter of fact, Beethoven uh, set a lot of his poems and stuff to music. So he was a contemporary with, with Beethoven. But he made this statement, and I love this statement. Why don't you listen to me? Listen to me and say amen, okay? All right. 
Hell begins the day that God shows you all the things you could have done, should have done, and would have done, but you didn't do it. That's great. I want to say that again. Now think about this. He said, hell begins the day that God shows you all the things you could have done and should have done and would have done, but you didn't do it. I say amen and amen to that. And I don't want to be that kind of believer, and I don't believe you do either. So the third thing is, is this. We've got to realize that avoiding risk can lead to regrets. Avoiding risk can lead to regrets. Now, there are two types of regrets. We know what they are. The, the first type of regret, we, we, we talk about it a lot. We, preachers preach about it. And that is the regrets of our actions. And, you know, and preachers like me, they get up, you know, and they talk about, you know, the regret of your sin, the regret of your, your actions. And we say, don't do this and, and don't do that. You know, we have, you know, we try to lay a guilt trip and people have regrets. And, you know, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I have regrets of my actions as well. But uh, we have all of this list of don'ts. Don't, don't do this. And, you know, and, and basically what that is, is that's trying to develop a right relationship with God by subtraction. In other words, we say, you know, the, the least things you do, you know, the better off you are. And, and that's kind of the philosophy we have. Don't do this and don't do that. And, you know, and that's probably one reason why 80% of people don't even darken the door of a church anymore because they think that's what we're all about. And, and, with that, and we hammer this, you know, regrets of your actions. And then I'm, not getting, I'm not against preaching against sin and all that. I, I, yes, we, we preach against it. And, and yes, your sin brings consequences and, and, and all of that. And, and we understand that. And there, there, there's, there's, you know, there's room for that. And there's, you know, encouragement for that as well. But, uh, you know, we just say, hey, what, what you need to guard and what you need to spend most of your Christian life doing is making sure... You don't get into trouble. Making sure you don't do anything wrong. And so we guard our life and we try to make sure we don't get in trouble. We don't, you know, we don't get in, do anything wrong. And that's how you please God. And we, we understand that. But there's another area of regrets that we don't hardly ever talk about, especially in church. And that's not just the regrets of our actions, but the regrets of our inactions. The regrets of our inactions. You see, these, these are the regrets of the things that we should have done. Th- these are the regrets of the things, you know, we, we had conviction, you know, and the pastor was talking about, you know, I'm going to get around to that one day, or maybe I should do that, and, and you didn't do it, and you, you were afraid, well, what will somebody think, or I, I don't think I have the money, or, you know, you know I, I, maybe I should have gone on that mission trip, or maybe I should have given that sacrificial gift, or maybe I should have witnessed to that brother, uh, all of these things, you know, it, and we do have these regrets of our in actions. They, those are the things that we wish we should have done. And I don't know about you, I don't want to see Jesus face to face with a list. I certainly don't want to see Jesus face to face with a list of regrets of my sinful actions. I get that. But how many of you say amen? I don't want to see Jesus face to face with my regrets of my inactions and all the things I left undone too. And all God's people say, I don't want, I don't want to do that either. Ed Young was talking about him and a friend that were uh, out on a little boat. Ed Young loves, he's the pastor of Fellowship uh, Church in uh, Texas. And uh, he was talking about him and a friend that were, they were out fishing and uh, out, of, out, in this, uh, out in the ocean. And they were down in Florida and they, and they, were, they were near and by this beautiful marina. You know, where all of, these, all of these boats were. All of these, you know, 500,000, you know, million dollar yachts were, were and, you know, not, not long ago, uh, Phyllis and I w- met my daughter and her husband for a couple days down in Charleston. And, uh, you know, we, we went to a place, and we, th- there was a place there, and they had these humongous boats. I mean, they're just yachts. And the first thing, I, th- I don't know about you when you see that. When I see that, I think, where do people get their money? Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, that's, where, where, who can afford this? And then another thought strikes me. Why are they here? You got a million dollar boat and it's here. 
Why isn't it out in the water somewhere? Is it just me? I mean, you know, and every time you see those big boats, they're not in the water. They're just tied up by the dock. Well, Ed Young said that uh, they'd been out fishing. They were just in a little John boat. They are just in a little, you know, boat. You know, the kind that you guys probably have. But anyway, and uh, I don't have one, by the way. I've got a name for my boat. Y'all know that, don't you? I've, na- I've got a name. If I ever get a boat, I'm going to name it Visitation. And if you call the church office and say, can I speak to pastor? My secretary's going to say, he ain't here. He's on visitation. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, you know. So, so anyway, so they, they've been out fishing, and they're coming. And they were, they, were, they, were getting, they were in the marina, beautiful resort area, but they noticed in the corner of their eye there was a guy who was swimming. I mean, he was they noticed a figure in the water. And then, th- then they noticed that, that there was another boat just within arm's reach, kind of, you know, just out of, out of arm's reach for him, and he kept kind of reaching for the boat. And they thought, you know, I don't think that guy's swimming for pleasure. I think that guy is in trouble. So they take their little John boat over, and they go over to the guy, and they both reach in, and they pulled this guy in. They said he's a big guy, and they, they almost capsized, and they got him in, and the guy was just almost out of breath, and he, he was saying, thank you. He said, oh, thank you. He said, you guys, I, 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 just, I was going down. I was going down. He said, I can't, I, I can't thank you enough. You saved my life. And what happened is he fell out of his, out of his boat, and the tide was just taking his boat out, and he couldn't reach it, and he couldn't get to shore, and he was getting tired, and he, had, you know, and he was just getting ready to drown when they, when they came up, and they rescued him. And he said, thank you so much. And so, you know, they helped the guy get his breath, make sure he composed himself, you know, and he kind of hugged them, and they all high-fived each other, and, and they, they got their little boat and got him into his boat, and he cranked it up, made sure he was going out. So now they're coming back into the marina, like that. And they're high-fiving each other. They said, man, we saved a life. We saved somebody's life today. And then Ed Young says he started looking at all of those yachts, and 500,000 and million-dollar Boats at shore, tied up to the docks. And he thought to himself, that's the church. That's the church. There, there are people out there, you know, we, we've got, we've got million-dollar churches, we've got million-dollar buildings, we've got million-dollar programs. And yet we'd rather stay safe to the dock. We don't want to get out there. We, we, don't, we don't want to get out there where people are. And here they were, and they're just their little old John boat, just their little 35-horsepower motor, and they had saved a life. And he thought to himself, you know what? Those, somebody in those, one of those, they own one of those boats, they could have saved a life too had they been out there, had they not been tied up to the dock. He said, that's where our churches are. We want to play it safe. We're, we're so afraid that we're going to do something wrong. And I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that too. I'm so afraid I'm going to lead this church to do something wrong. I'm so afraid we're going to reach out and do something wrong. But but maybe we ought to quit worrying about doing something wrong and just do something and do it for Jesus and do it right. And all God's people say that. And so, he says, listen, you you got to understand that if you don't take a risk, you may have a regret. And I don't want to see Jesus face to face with regrets of the things I could have done. So, you got any lions backing you up against the wall? Are you in a place when you don't know what to do? You know? Here's the thing I want to leave you with. Don't, don't be afraid that... Uh, if you chase that lion, that your life's going to end. Be more afraid that if you don't chase it, your life will never begin. 
And that's what we've got to say. There's an unusual little phrase in, in the Scripture in John chapter 6. It, and, and, and it's the story of the disciples out on the, out on the, the right after the feeding of the 5,000. And, and, and Jesus, you know, they get in a boat, and Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray, and, and they launch out, and they're in the Sea of Galilee. And a, and a horrible storm comes up in the middle of the night. You, you remember that story? And, and, they, and they see Jesus coming, you know, walking on the water. And, uh, but it's an amazing thing. Uh, the Gospel of John uh, says something that's it's really kind of strange. I've never really noticed it before. But it's in verse 21. Listen, listen to what it is. John 6, 21. He said, Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Here's the thing about storms. Here's the thing about your back bent against the wall. When you're in a storm, the only thing you can see is what you can't see. I mean, that's what you see. You see the clouds, you see the rain, you see the wind, and you don't see what you need to see. And it wasn't until they invited Jesus and said, Jesus, you've got to get in our situation. You've got to get up in here. And the Bible says when they did that immediately, that boat was it? Listen, it had been heading that way all along. They just couldn't see it until Jesus got in the situation. And my friend, listen, your back may be against the wall, and you may be going down for the count, and maybe you think you're drowning, or maybe you're thinking you're facing a lion, but I'm telling you, where you need to move, where you need to go, is that you just make a beeline to Jesus, get Jesus in your situation, and you will find that he'd been leading you all along, and all God's people said that's right. Absolutely right. Run toward Jesus. Even if you've got to run down a lion to do it. Because he's in charge and he's Lord of all. How many of you believe that tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together.